And I just want to make the territorial acknowledgement that we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations and the Métis Chartered Community of the Lower Mainland Region. And you are all in your respective locations on that land, caring for it and the people on it with respect and humbleness. Um, I want to hand it over to Justin Gill, uh, one of our newer transplant nephrology recruits, um, to introduce both our speaker and the topic. So, Dr. Gill, over to you. Thanks, uh, Dara. Um, so, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, as Dara mentioned, by those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Justin Gill. I, I joined the Transplant Nephrology Group at St. Paul's Hospital back in 2020. So, it's a pleasure to be uh, introducing our guest speaker today. So, as you all know, the transplant community is always looking for uh, novel strategies to increase organ donation. Um, uh, just as some context, myself and some of my colleagues, including John and Jag Gill, who many of you know, are uh, going to be conducting some research looking at public acceptance of a reciprocity-based strategy to increase living donation rates in BC, as well as the relevant legal considerations in doing so. We're hoping this work can directly inform policy implementation in British Columbia and the rest of our country. And so this is directly along the lines of the work that Professor Levy has done in Israel, and he'll be talking to us more about this today. So just uh, as an introduction for our speaker today, Professor Jacob Levy founded the Heart Transplantation Unit at the Livia Heart Center of the Sheba Medical Center in Israel in 1991, and has ser had served as its director until 2020. He is a professor of surgery emeritus at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Medicine, where he received his MD cum laude degree. He was trained in cardiothoracic surgery at the Sheba Medical Center and in heart transplantation at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in the USA. He is currently the medical assistant in risk management to the Sheba Medical Center General Director. The heart transplantation unit at the Sheba Medical Center is the largest of its kind in Israel, with over 300 heart transplantations performed to date. Since 1997, Professor Levy has, developed, uh, has also developed an active ventricular assist device program, and in 2001, he implanted the first in-man HeartMate II left ventricular assist device. Professor Levy in the, uh, is the past president of the Israel Transplantation Society, and the past chairman of the Israel Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery. He also served as chairman of the Heart and Lung Transplantation Committee of Israel's National Transplant Center, as a member of the Executive Committee of the Declaration of Istanbul Custodian Group, and as a member of the Ethics Committee of the Transplantation Society. He is a member of the Israeli National Council of Heart and Vascular Diseases, a member of the International Advisory Board of the Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting NGO, and a member of the Ethics Committee of the International Heart and Lung Transplantation Society. Professor Levy spearheaded the preparations of the, Israel, uh, sorry, of the Israeli organ transplant law in 2008, with its unique clauses which have significantly reduced outgoing transplant tourism from Israel, blocking outgoing transplant patients to China altogether, while significantly increasing local deceased and living organ donations by prioritizing registered organ donors. It's truly a pleasure to introduce Professor Levy today, and I want to thank him for coming to speak to us. Jay, please take it away. Thank you so much, Justin, for this uh, very kind introduction, and good morning to all of you in Canada from here in Israel, where it's is late afternoon. Uh, we have tried to share the screen. I know you see the, the bottom notes, but uh, for some reason we cannot increase the screen. I hope you uh, bear with me. So, uh, good morning again, and uh, I want first to thank deeply the University of British Columbia Division of Nephrology, especially Dr. John Gill for their kind invitation to this webinar. And as you heard, I was charged with a mission to share with you the results of the Israeli organ allocation policy that promotes organ donation by prioritizing both registered and live donors. So an alternative, uh, let me see if it, Let's see. Yeah, okay. An alternative uh, title to uh, my presentation would be, if you don't give, you will be the last one to receive. Can we modify an organ allocation by incentivizing organ donation? Uh, I have no relevant financial uh, uh, relationship to disclose. My talk will uh, discuss three solutions to the question, how to increase disease and living organ donation we have adopted in Israel. First, I will discuss measures taken to decrease or block outgoing transplant tourism. I will then uh, discuss uh, the measures we have taken to increase opting in and organ donation concentrate. 
And finally, the measures we have taken to remove disincentives for live organ donation. I will not discuss the opting out policy as it has been thoroughly evaluated in Israel by an officially commissioned uh, committee and has been dismissed as a current good and viable option for the Israeli public. And I will also not discuss donation after controlled circulatory death, which is currently, unfortunately, still illegal in Israel, as well as in other several countries. Organ donation rate, as you know from deceased donors in Israel, has been in the past one of the lowest among most other Western countries, being only eight in the year 2010, as compared, for example, as you can see here, to 25 deceased donors in the United States, or 32 in Spain, or in your country, 14.5 back in 2010. The causes for the low organ donation rate have always been multifactorial. However, one of the major causes has been the reimbursement of transplant tourism by Israeli HMOs and insurance companies, which have covered most of the high expenses of these transplants wherever they were available around the globe. These reimbursements of transplant tourists were provided irrespective of the legality of the process in distant the destination due to lack of any legal uh, restraints. Up to 2008, China has been on one of the major venues for outgoing Israeli transplant tourists, in addition to hotspots venues like the Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Colombia, and all were fully reimbursed, lowering the incentive for increasing local organ donation. In March 2008, the Israeli parliament enacted the organ transplant law, which is unique and groundbreaking in several aspects. The law first defines and outlaws organ trade by stating that a person should not receive any compensation in exchange for an organ that has been procured or is planned to be procured from his or another person's body. A person should not give any compensation in exchange for an organ that has been transplanted or is planned to be transplanted in his or another person's body. And a person should not act directly or indirectly as a middleman between an organ donor and recipient for the purpose of procuring or transplanting an organ. The law further states that a person who will perform any of these uh, of the above will be sentenced to three years in jail and will be fined according to the penalty law, and that all of these orders uh, will be applied whether the organ procurement or transplant will be performed within or outside Israel, rendering the law to become fully extraterritorial. Finally, the law, uh, does not preclude the performance of organ transplantation in a country outside Israel, including reimbursement by an Israeli body of organ transplantation performed outside Israel, if both of the following are maintained. The procurement of the organ and its transplantation has been performed according to the law in the country under discussion, and second, the orders against organ trade as stipulated by the Israeli law are kept. Shortly after the parliament has accepted the law, Rules have been issued ordering all Israelis insurance companies to stop reimbursing any organ transplant performed in countries where illegal procurement or organ trade have been known to take place. These rules were immediately implemented by the insurance company, which brought transplant tourism from Israel to China since 2008 to a complete and abrupt halt. And since then, not a single Israeli patient has undergone an, undergone an organ transplantation in China. Furthermore, these rules have also helped to significantly reduce the total number of transplant tourists from Israel to other hotspot venues in the world, cutting the number of kidney transplantation performed on Israeli patients abroad from as high as 155 patients back in 2006 to only 40 patients in 2020. The Israeli judiciary system has also started to prosecute and incarcerate organ brokers and middlemen based upon the new law, and this will help to further reduce and maybe even stop altogether the criminal activity. To increase the rate of registering as organ donors and increase the actual concentrate for deceased organ donation, countries usually are use very creative public campaigns and advertising, such as this one from the United States, for example, or this, sorry, or these exquisite one from Argentina. However, the success of these kinds of campaigns to significantly raise the actual concentrate for organ donation are very limited. 
While blocking outgoing transplant tourism was a needed first step to incentivize local organ donation, there was a need to deal with another major cause for the low donation rate, the so-called free riding behavior of those who, for various reasons, reject brain death and thus organ donation, yet do not abstain from being active candidates for organ transplantation themselves. This phenomenon arouses significant antagonism towards organ donation and has been repeatedly cited in public opinion surveys in Israel as one of the major reasons for the low consent rate in our country. The case which prompted me to act was an ultra-Orthodox Jewish patient of mine who back in 2005 was hospitalized in my department for several months as a status rank candidate for heart transplantation, who confided with me one day on rounds that although he was lying there in bed waiting desperately for the goodwill of the next of kin of some deceased brain dead donor to save his own life by consenting for a heart donation, if the situation would have been reversed, he said, and he would have been asked to give his permission for the donation of the organs of his relatives who has just been declared brain dead, he would not have done so based upon his religious belief. I still remember to this very day myself becoming enraged at the hypocrisy of living by double standards. If you are not willing to donate an organ, I told myself, you should also refrain from becoming a candidate for organ transplantation yourself. I have therefore proposed to my colleagues at the Israel National Transplant Center to include in the new Israeli organ transplant law a unique and unprecedented clause aimed to both incentivize potential donation and penalize free riding. My proposal has been thoroughly discussed by an officially commissioned multidisciplinary committee and has eventually been incorporated into the law. The law sets a new organ allocation policy whereby candidates for organ transplantation who have been registered as organ donors for at least three years prior to being listed will be prioritized during organ allocation. Based upon this law, the rules grant top priority to candidates whose first degree relatives donated organs after death or candidates who have been themselves live kidney or live liver lung donors. Second priority by the law is granted to candidates who have registered as organ donors at least three years prior of being listed. Based upon these two priority categories, we have formulated the following allocation scoring system for each of the two priority categories for the various transplanted organs, which are added, I repeat, are added to the candidate's regular medical allocation scores. Children younger than 18 years old or legally invalid candidates for the purpose of signing the donor card will not be included in their prioritization plan and will return their priority status for organ allocation versus an adult who merits priority. Status one candidates for heart or liver transplantation will continue to be given priority for organ allocation as usual, irrespective of their eligibility status based on their new prioritization category. However, if two such candidates are equally suitable for a donated organ, and that happens quite often, then the one who qualifies for one of the priority categories will be given the organ. The implementation of the new policy has been preceded by an intensive year-long multimedia and multilingual public campaign which brought the new law to the attention of the public by various web-based venues such, such as these one that you see right now on the screen, by a TV campaign led by Israel leading news anchormen who carried the campaign's slogan, waiting in line is sometimes a matter of life, sign the donor card and be prioritized in the waiting list to transplant. And with these roadside billboards and public transportation advertisement, which all notify the public that the donor card can also be very easily signed by simply picking any phone and dialing 6262. The new donor card has been a change and it carried now, carries now the slogan, give life, get life. And the new policy has been officially launched on April 1st, 2012, and the results were quite impressive. Not only has a cumulative number of registered donors significantly and continuously increasing, as can be seen in this graph, but most importantly, 
the actual authorization rate for organ donation by the donors next of kin rose from 40 to or 50 percent to an all-time high of 65 percent in 2018 comparing quite favorably to the u.s national concentrate of 70 percent in that particular year the new israeli organ allocation policy resurrects an old ethical principle in nature which is termed reciprocal altruism which basically emphasizes the survival benefit of animal or human groups in which each partner is helping the other while he helps himself. The altruist benefits because in time he is helped in turn. While it is true that the new prioritization policy violates the definition of pure altruism, which requires, as we all know, no uh, quid pro quo reward, and also violates the ideal of medical care, that medical care should be allocated based on medical need only and not extraneous factors such as the patient's ethnic origin, wealth, or behavior. However, most people who sign an organ donor card will never need an organ themselves and in all likelihood will ultimately receive no material reward for their promised donation. And true believers in the immorality of organ donation after brain death would not be affected by the new law because if organ donation after brain death is wrong, then it should also be wrong for their own potential organ donors. And hence, they should not participate in this immorality by becoming candidates for organ transplantation and accepting an organ. And finally, if this policy achieves the goal of obtaining more organ, then it promotes a different but a very important goal in medicine which is achievement of maximum health. So everyone will benefit. And even people who do not sign the donor card, although disadvantaged, will nevertheless be better off than they would have been without this policy. A very elegant experimental support of the priority policy was provided by the 2012 Nobel Prize laureate in economics, Professor Alvin Roth and his research associate Judd Kessler. They have shown in a very elaborate experiment that the organ donation rate in the priority condition shown here in red is 2 to 2.5 times higher than in the control condition shown here in blue, and it's even supersedes the results of financial compensation for organ donation shown here in green. They have summarized their finding in this paper and conclude that organ allocation policy giving priority on the waiting list to those who previously registered as donors has a significant positive impact on registration. The Israeli priority policy has gained worldwide interest, including in your own country, in Canada, as can seen in this uh, article in newspaper. Singapore has already previously adopted a similar priority rule in organ allocation for candidates who have not opted out, and recently Chile has decided to follow the Israeli success and adopted a similar law. The last cause for the low organ donation rates, this time for live organ donation, were several disincentives for such donation which had to be removed. And the Israeli organ transplant law provides uh, uh, these, these measures to, rem sorry, to remove uh, these disincentives. So the, the law first uh, provides earning loss reimbursement of 40 days based on the donor's average income during the last three months prior to donation. An unemployed donor will be reimbursed based upon the minimum salary in the market at the time of donation. The law further provides a fixed sum transportation reimbursement to cover all commuting to and from the hospital for the donor for the entire hospitalization and follow-up period. Reimbursement of seven days of recovery in a recuperation facility within three months after, months after donation. Five years reimbursement of medical, work capability loss, and life insurances, all to be reimbursed upon submitting appropriate insurance policies and payment receipts. And finally, reimbursement of five psychological consultation and treatments upon submitting appropriate receipt. To answer any claim that either one of you may have, as if all of these reimbursements may be considered as financial incentives for live organ donation, here are the average actual sum of reimbursement in US dollars. And as can clearly be seen, this can hardly be considered as high enough financial incentives. To sum it all up, 
here is the impressive increase in kidney transplantation from live donors. I repeat live donors in Israel over the years, making Israel, as you can see here under the red arrow, the current leading country in the world in terms of the number of live kidney donors per million population with 32 live donors per million. As much as we would love to attribute these results solely to the transplant law, which I have uh, now displayed, there are certainly other causes to these mostly non-designated live donation that are often driven by a genuine religious belief of those live donors of performing a noble act of kindness. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude my presentation by freely quoting Robert Frost. Blocking outgoing transplant tourism by banning its reimbursement, adopting the priority in organ allocation to live and registered donors, and finally removing financial disincentives to live donation. By doing all this, we have taken the road less traveled by, and that, that has made all the difference. And with this nice aerial view of my city, Tel Aviv, I thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Jay. That was a great talk uh, and really informative on the Israeli experience with reciprocity-based strategies. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, of course, raise your hand or, or and we can unmute you or um, put them in the chat box, please. Uh, Justin, if I, I'll go first. Uh, Jay, mm -hmm. first of all, thank you for like summarizing experience. The there's a couple of things here that I, I just wanted to contextualize for the, for the audience. Um, the reason this is uh, very timely for us is, is uh, really, first of all, we have an, a, a long um, a need to increase organ donation. Um, and uh, the strategies in Canada have always been opt-in. Um, many people will be aware that Nova Scotia has adopted an opt out uh, an opt out policy and the early sort of returns on that have been less than impressive and uh and i think that that context should be concerning to all of us because as you know adira sets the stage for all of these uh these uh these calls we are all aware of uh the disparities that exist in our healthcare system and in fact systemic racism in our uh, in our healthcare system so the concept of uh, 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 an opt-out system is one that I think is very different in uh, difficult to, for me to consider, considering our pluralistic uh, uh, population and the ethnic diversity. And we've seen, um, even uh, Jay, you may not be aware, but you know we still have uh, uh, significant issues come to life with vaccination around COVID, uh, where people have, you know, significant concerns about a mandate from a government or a legislated um, yeah, uh, I read the news. Yeah. I so read the news. Yeah. so yeah. that's the context with which we are. And so in in and as you know, the 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 the, the provinces are so variable in their in their uh, success with deceased organ donation. So this is particularly um, important at this time for that context. And, and um, uh, the experience, the question that I'm always going to ask you, Jay, is, is um, I haven't visited Israel, but we are very pluralistic. Do you think that um, the, the uh, diversity of the population in terms of ethnic and cultural background is, how do you see that as a, as a is that an enabler or a, a challenge uh, uh, to considering reciprocity-based strategies? That's really the crux of my, uh, my question. Well, I guess you're fully aware of the diversity of the Israeli population. I'm not sure it's as diverse as Canada, but at least two people are living within our small country, the Jews and, and the Arab, Muslim Arabs. And I can tell you for a fact that this law has been accepted by 99% of the members of parliament, which includes uh, at least 15% of our, our Arab neighbors, our, our Arab uh, uh, citizens. So it, was, it has been accepted, fully accepted by both Jews and Muslims, and it has, fully, has been fully implemented uh, in both societies living in, in Israel. So as far as uh, implementing such a law in a very diversified country like, you, like yours, 
I really honestly think that it will be will be uh, accepted by most of most of the people because it makes sense. I mean, people people relate to it. If you if you are willing to give, then you should receive some token of appreciation by 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 the government or by the organ allocation policy, and that's basically what what it's all about. Thanks, Jay. I think that's really important because the 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 ability to translate um, this and. The other thing that I, I just wanted to point out to the audience is, is we lump um, rewards-based um, uh, 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 strategies like a reciprocity brace strategy, I think unfairly, this is my opinion, in a, a big bucket of incentives for donation. And the argument has always been that this will lead to a slippery slope where um, at the far end of this, this will lead to payments uh, for donation. Jay, can you tell us the types of when you were on the on the on the front lines of trying to implement this policy? Can you take us through some of those considerations uh, as, as you implemented uh, uh, this in, in in Israel and and how you had to uh, address that? Well, you know, before the uh, law has been enacted by by the parliament, as I told you, there has been a lot of a full year discussion within various. Uh, 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 parts of our society, whether this law will be accepted. And it, as much as we're worried that it might be accepted in a, a negative manner by some groups, we were, all of us really, first of all, myself as one who has suggested it, were totally surprised by the, the, the way it has been accepted by all the various I mean, religious Jews, ultra-religious Jews. Everybody accepted it. Remember, the, uh, we have the ultra-Orthodox part of the Israeli society who do not accept the idea of brain death. And that's why they, they have always rejected the idea. But now that they can be prioritized in the, in the transplant waiting list by becoming in live donors, and they even are prioritized more than the one who is registered donor, okay? then this has equalized the, the, the differences between the various parts of society. You're mute, uh, John. Yeah, I was gonna comment, our society has diversity of many religions and also um, some cultural and, and interesting distrust of medical professions. So I think, I agree with you, it should be a way to knit the community together um, and I think that that's part of the work that um, Justin and, and John and everyone else is really attempting to do. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one of them is whether about incentivizing do uh, donation has the potential to increase in equity because in some of our um, cultural and ethnic groups, they have very high rates of diabetes and then they're less able to be a donor. Um, no, that's, that's, maybe I'll, I'll answer each, yeah. and each question uh, separately. That's a very good question, and uh, both John and, and Justin, when I first heard about your current uh, uh, idea of adopting a similar priority policy, however, only for live donations and not for registered donors, in, this worries me a bit because if you prioritize only based on live donation, then such an inequality might happen. Now, if you could balance it, by giving priority to those who registered, then those who could not provide priority by becoming live donors can get the same kind of priority by becoming a registered donor, okay? So that's something that will you and I, and I'll hope uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think together, that's a potential problem or difference, let's say, I'm not, I'm not saying a problem, a difference between what you're suggesting and what we have implemented in Israel. I hope I made myself clear about, about this point. That's something uh, we should do. Okay, the next question, how do you address family uh, veto? Uh, will the National Organ Donor Registry be held within Canada? Well, uh, family veto are very, very rare in Israel. I know they are not very, but quite common in the United States. I've been talking, I've given a similar talk in several places in the United States, and I've heard that uh, vetoing the family is something very common. In Israel, in general, when a per person has registered as an organ donor, a deceased uh, organ donor, uh, this registration is considered by 
99% of the families as a sort of a living will of this person. And if the situation arouses and he becomes brain dead, then the family uh, 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 respects the, the registration. So while theoretically, uh, uh, one of the dangers, potential dangers that, that we were warned against before implementing our law that people were registered, you know, fake registration just to get to get uh, prioritized and then we'll have a lot of vetoes. That has never materialized, never, okay? So that's, that's a, a very good question. I, I just wanted to comment on the, on the um, what uh, we're thinking about. And Jay, to your point about, so folks, what we're, what Justin, Justin, maybe you should uh, um, introduce a little bit about what we're thinking about with live donation. And then we can comment on the first question about potentially creating um, uh, inequity. So Justin, do you wanna just give a thumbnail of, of, of the proposed, um, research that you're doing? Sure, yeah, so right now we're looking at a kind of similar reciprocity-based strategy in registered living donors. And, um, you know, jumping off of Jay's work, which we this is why we thought it was relevant to talk about it today, we're gonna to look at both um, public opinions of this. So we're gonna do a mixed method study looking at public opinions from various groups um, as to what they think about this reciprocity-based strategy to increase living donation rates. And uh, interestingly, we're also gonna look at what the opinions are of the currently waitlisted candidates as well, because these people are the ones that could be potentially um, you know, adversely affected by, by such a thing. Like if we start to prioritize um, people based on reciprocity-based strategies, the current people that are actively waitlisted for kidney transplants or other organ transplants may be adversely affected in, in certain ways. And so just getting their opinions as to what they, their thoughts of it are that's going to be the kind of launching point, and then hopefully that'll that'll move forward to propose to kind of inform some more public policy, and um, at least in British Columbia, and then we can move forward in the rest of Canada eventually. But that's where we're starting from. So, so Jay, one of the one of the real practical thanks, Justin, for that. One of the real practical issues here is, is, is for us. So, folks, we're 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 primarily considering this for people who come forward as living donors, whether they be directed, anonymous, compatible pairs, doesn't matter. Um, and, and the idea there would be is, is that if you had come forward as a living donor, um, and, and uh, here's the, the thing, we wouldn't necessarily exclude people who were worked up and excluded on the basis of a health condition. So okay. we're we're trying to we are trying to um, um, encourage interest and broad awareness about living donation. So if you had initiated a workup and you 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 had gone in the process and the and the the medical decision was that you would be excluded, I think we're trying to reward the act and the engagement because in our program, our experience for for people on the call is 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 we work up over five potential living donors to identify one. Mm -hmm. So it literally takes a village. And I actually think there's great value when a donor comes forward, but they can't donate because it still has a huge effect within that person's circle to encourage others to donate. So that's how we would address that. The reason we're focusing on living donation is we in our province as a kidney community really only have the ability. And I want to push this because um, and, and Justin shares this passion is, is, is that because on the other side of the country, we have a, a, a very opposite approach. And I know that for us to implement something that is very narrow and gives people confidence in the kidney community, which we can, for example, implement perhaps more rapidly in living kidney donation, if we were to try to bring on all deceased um, uh, or organs, this is the part where I am, I am concerned. I, I know that um, to move things forward, sometimes it's better to get a quick um, demonstration of effectiveness and then expand. So you went for the entire because you had an issue across all organs, which we do as well too. But in our system, and the, the other piece of this, just to give folks context of why we're only talking about this in living kidney donation, is that in North America, the kidney pair donation programs in the United States have introduced a voucher-based system. And yep. just very briefly, without you know, taking too much time, the National Kidney Register, which is based out of Connecticut, is the largest not-for-profit, not but privately run 
kidney paired exchange program. They basically link transplant centers to exchange kidneys. And they actively, I could use the word solicit anonymous donors to donate through their program. And the, the reward incentive is, is a voucher that they can name somebody who, if they needed a kidney, they would get prioritized. The only ethical concern that's been raised about that system is what if the National Kidney Register doesn't exist in 25 years? How are they going to make good on the future voucher that, that may be provided? So we are trying to do something in our jurisdiction, which we can implement quickly and give confidence. So it's not that we are not considering the bigger piece of the deceased donation it's a little bit of understanding the, the reaction that would happen, our ability to move and, and actually implement and study the experience and, 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 and do it, and then open the discussion to um, deceased donation on a broader scale. So that's our thinking. It may be incorrect. And so actually that's one of the main reasons I wanted to, for, to it was is sort of one of the questions I was going to ask Within the different organ groups, I mean, this is the this is the practical challenge we're having. So your reflections on on our approach, I think, are very are, are very helpful. John I, and Justin, I guess I should have mentioned. I, I'm sure you, all of you know that the UNOS has for years the policy of prioritizing live donors in organ allocation of kidney allocation. Yes. So that's that's something that we have not invented in Israel. Okay, that's something that practiced in the by UNOS for many years. Yeah, so that is for the donor themselves, but the, 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 yeah, and so, so we have that as well too, Jay. So we have that, that, that process has been in. So past donors get priority on the deceased donor waiting list. That safety net for the donor exists. What we believe is, is really, there's been a lot of work with our, our, our collaborator in Alberta, a fellow named Scott Clarenback on nudge psychology. And really, we believe that there are a lot of people who are thinking about living kidney donation. And, um, uh, and importantly, Jay, the other real shift is, is we've moved towards a lot of older people donating. Um, and so we think that, you know, if somebody can say, hey, I could leave a living will, the equivalent of a living will to one of my family members if I donated, that this may lead to a significant increase. And so we feel that this is something that, that should be tested. It's something that we can systematically look at as a policy implementation with our province as an antidote, frankly, to what's going on in Nova Scotia, um, but then to potentially give us experience for the, for, for the broader question of, of reciprocity and deceased donation. I hope that frames it out. Sorry, Justin, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, speak too much, but that, I just thought of giving that context of why we're thinking in a more narrow uh, uh, perspective is, is, is important. I see David Landsberg has a question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that was uh, an excellent talk and I must congratulate you on your su success. And in particular, the, uh, the positive impact that you've had on both living and deceased donation. Uh, it's a common belief that the two don't necessarily uh, success in one leads to uh, failure in the other and vice versa. Uh, that if you're very strong in living donation, then there's uh, no incentive for deceased donation. And if you have a very strong deceased donor program, why are people going to be living donors? But you've proven that wrong. Um, I'm particularly impressed by the absolutely astounding uh, increase you had in the number of living donors. And uh, I'm wondering whether you, it, it, it's hard to believe that, you're, that the success is, can be attributed to uh, just by the, uh, the, the willingness to prioritize uh, uh, the, uh, the donors, uh, the, the uh, um, Loss of this, you know, removing disincentives is, uh, as you say, uh, you know, eh, nobody's signing up to uh, eh, to get a reward. Uh, you know, there might be a few people who might be nudged. So I'm wondering how much of that is, you know, as much as this is really impressive, is Israel specific, and how much, you know, there are the uh, ultra orthodox uh, Jews who. Uh, although won't support uh, deceased donation because they don't believe that it look at it as, as you said, and a, and a great act of kindness to to donate. I know that there, 
uh, I I know that there are some some uh, some uh, Haredi groups in North America who, um, you know, may, many many members of their community have been uh, non-directed donors. How much of that is a factor? Yeah, as I've alluded already in my presentation, I I'd love to take credit for all this. A tremendous increase in live donation. In I mean, it's, it is no matter how you got it, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, to be honest, and and I mentioned it, uh, uh, at least fifty percent of of this really? tremendous increase, if not more, uh, has nothing to do with the priority. I have to be to be to be honest. These are really non-designated uh, ultra uh, donors among the ultra orthodox community who really. Uh, perceive live organ donation, you know, just for the benefit of donation of making good as the most noble deed a person can do. And it reaches the point that where there are, you know, some small uh, towns where it becomes a, 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 uh, a matter of uh, how many live donors you have in your family. And, and families are competing with, with, between one. It, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I agree. So uh, to cut short my answer, uh, definitely not all of this uh, increase in live donation relates to the removing of these incentives. Although, as I said, when we presented, when I remember when I sat for many, many uh, uh, sittings with the member of uh, uh, the Committee of uh, Health of our parliament when we formulated the law, and when we could present to the ultra-Orthodox uh, members of, of parliament the fact that by providing a live donation, they will be prioritized similar to all those who are registered, then this took off the table the issue issues of being inequity, you see, because they, they right, even get sure. prioritized yeah. even yeah. higher. So that was the mo most important part of it. In, uh, there, in, in, in uh, the, that type of donation, uh, the, the altruistic donor, are, uh, is, is there any... Uh, um, are they allowed to stipulate uh, the characteristics of the of the recipient? Uh, you know, uh, no, is there uh, you know are they saying are is there some people who say well uh, not, you know not to not to a non heredi or not to a non you know you know what I'm no, saying? It started like that and it has totally been abolished and now that it's a, tool, a real honest to God uh, non designated donation and there are many cases where they, these uh, kidneys go from Jews to Arabs and vice versa. Yeah, so in our non-directed donation program, uh, which we have, uh, you know, which we struggle to get a fraction, I think, of the number of donors, uh, I, you know, one, one of the, the first things is to explain to people is you, you, you have no uh, ability to uh, designate uh, any, any, any characteristics of the recipient Absolutely. other than somebody who needs it. Absolutely. Yeah, the same. Thank you. Um Jay, if I, if I may, I want to come back to the issue that um, if you don't have a, a, you know, somebody who can't donate for, for a health reason or whatever, I, I think the, the real perspective, and we do have a real education piece for, for, for people on the waiting list, any kidney that comes into the system basically benefits everybody um, in the sense that um, there is less, the waiting list is smaller. And I think that perspective is really important. We haven't really capitalized on the linkage. Um, and so what's unique, actually, just to, to really elaborate a little on this, is, is, is we conceptually, as David said, um, often view living and deceased donation as somehow disconnected. And so if one goes up, the other goes down. What we're really challenging here is, is, is the notion that um, a, a, a reward, so a, the equivalent of a living will for somebody who comes forward as a living donor, lets them have name to be, to be determined. How many people, people always ask, how many people would you be able to name and, 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 and so forth. But those details to be worked out with lots of engagement of, of the community. But the, 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 the concept that I always state in, in response to that is, so we're considering even if you get excluded, it doesn't matter. We just want people to come forward. But the issue really is, is, is that um, the, the notion that you're taking away competition from the waiting list, if I can phrase it that way, is one that is, I think is an educational one uh, 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 to people. I also think that in terms of the, you know, the unfairness issue, I think that this, um, there is a real sense um, in some ethnic minority groups that these 
initiatives won't benefit um, people from my community or from my culture. Um, and I think that that's something that does require more discussion. I think that for a variety of reasons, we know that people can't complete the living donor evaluation and they can't um, um, uh, uh, complete that. So if we know that that's an unfair playing surface already, um, you know, we have to, I think, tackle those inherent um, um, uh, 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 weaknesses in our system to make sure that it's an aving equal playing surface. So the other piece of this that you nicely highlighted was the removal of the disincentives to donation. And, and we're not there yet. I mean, we were the first in, in, in Canada to implement this, but we still have significant financial disincentives, for example, to donation. And so the other pieces, your, your comments I, 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 on, on the other key critical pieces for implementation was one thing I, I wanted you to comment on. And then I know you didn't talk about opt-out, but I, I wanna ask you to comment about a little bit about your, 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 your strong statement about opt-out. Yeah, we had, as I mentioned, we had a, uh, a specially commissioned committee by the Minister of Health that, that dealt for quite a while about the potential, the possibility of implementing the opting out uh, policy in Israel. And we had a lot of presentation and I'm sure, uh, I hope that uh, our audience understand that opting out is not a magic formula for increasing organ donation. If you scan the world and look at countries that have adopted such law of opting out, you'll see that while some of them definitely have a very high and very nice uh, organ donation rate, but there are definitely several, more than several countries who have adopted the opting out who remained with a very low organ donation rate. Uh, Singapore to name just one, but there are uh, several European countries as well. So, uh, a law, an opting out law can be successfully implemented only in a population, in a society where the basic incentive or the basic uh, 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 willingness of the society to donate is way higher than 50, 60 or 70 percent of the society are, are really for organ donation and with an opting out law you simply make their lives easier you don't you don't bother them with registering as organ donors but only bother those who really object to organ donation but when you have a society where the notion of organ donation is not something common among society the law cannot force uh, an increase in organ donation by, by making this life uh, uh, easier for, for, for these people because simply will people will simply opt out so when we discussed the, uh, these issues in Israel, at least, it was quite, quite uh, understandable that we, at least the Israeli society, is not yet ready for, or I'm not, I'm not sure it will, if it will ever be, but definitely at that time, Israeli society is not ready for, for the opting, uh, opting outlaw to be implemented. Thanks, Jay. Um... I think the, the other question really was, was um, on the disincentives uh, removal piece. Um, I don't know if Jag's on the call, but we have a lot of initiatives to try to um, enable living donation to make it less complicated. Um, and there's a big outreach. So the, the, the uniqueness of our provinces is, is I think that we are well positioned to address those concerns because there's already been significant investment in trying to um, remove barriers to living donation, more from the procedural part of view, but in our province also to really uh, eliminate the financial uh, disincentives, which are still there um, uh, uh, for living donors. And so there's a few also, I would say, unique uh, aspects to BC where uh, I think we could address these concerns, not just with lip service, but with really pointing to, um, you know, um, JAG's working on navigators to help people negotiate the system for, for both for recipients and donors for, for living donation. And I don't, I don't think, know if JAG's on to, to comment. I didn't see him on the call. He may, be, he may not be on, but that's just the other framework that I think is relevant for this because, um, and, and, and what we were hoping for, and, and Justin may, maybe please, please chime in. But what we're really, this is really the start. Uh, Professor Levy is gonna be involved in helping us actually uh, try to implement this, uh, this uh, policy in BC. Our first step as Justin alluded to is to have 
um, some public uh, engagement using both survey and uh, a focus group type of uh, type of engagement to really understand the concerns and perspectives. But what we're really on the, the, the cusp of for the audience is, is to say that, look, it's unfair to, to lump these reciprocity brace strategies into a wide bucket of, of incentives. Um, we are talking about something that is, would be highly regulated, not something that's commodifiable. You wouldn't be able to sell your, your, your living will to somebody. Um, all of these safeguards would be in place. And more importantly, it would be a government run uh, 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 policy. So it would be, you know, it would be our linking our waiting list. So we, we believe that this is, these are not impediments. Um, other members of our team in the Canadian context are Tim Cofield, who's a health law professor, who will be, you know, addressing this issue. Because if you read the law by the strict letter of the law, this would be illegal, um, uh, considered illegal. But we know that what is considered a valuable consideration is subject to interpretation, and it's never been tested um, in the market. So there's a lot the simple strategy that Jay has been able to pull off in Israel, it seems so elegant, but there are is a lot of considerations in public engagement. And the, what we hope to accomplish with this initial presentation is number one, to introduce this, but you're going to hear a lot about this um, uh, going forward because we really think that this is something that should be, have empiric evidence in, in the Canadian, in, in, in our province to see uh, what its impact is. And we think it's extremely timely given what's happening on the other side of the country. So Jay, I, I, I wanna thank you, first of all, for inspiring us to actually have the courage to actually seriously talk about this. Honestly, this would not have happened without your international leadership on, on this. And second of all, uh, I know Justin is gonna benefit greatly from the experience you've had behind the scenes um, uh, in trying to implement this. We didn't hear from any of our partners from BC Transplant who I know are on the line, um, but maybe it's because they have nothing to say. So Ed, if you're out there, would love to hear um, a, a comment from you, but um, this is where we're going. And so um, if you have concerns, come forward and let us know. We're really interested in knowing about it. Thank you very much. It's been a really a pleasure and I'm looking really forward to working with all of you because it's exciting to see how a policy which has been already implemented and, and been successful in Israel, I really hope we'll, we'll be able to transfer some of uh, the ideas to, to you guys in, in Canada. So I'm really looking forward for that. Great. Thank, yeah, thank you. It's been really stimulating and, uh, and encouraging. And I think, uh, again, patient focused and implementing different things in different parts of the world is always a challenge. And we benefit greatly from uh, the collaboration and the interaction. So again, thank you on behalf of uh, the patients of British Columbia, uh, and all of us trying to make it better for them. Thanks, thank everybody you. for your participation. Bye. Thanks, 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 Take care. Okay, bye bye. Bye.